Okay, well, good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming, and um, this is our second lecture, and it's actually our final lecture. Unfortunately, our other lecturer had to pull out um, for personal reasons. Uh, so we get the honor of Jeff is sort of bringing us home <laughs> in terms of uh, topics. Uh, the theme of the Stott Lecture um, has to do with the relationship of, of faith and science, but in particular around this issue of uh, the image of God. And um, Jeff Harden, or Dr. Jeff Harden, is a professor of biology at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Um, most recently, he was the head of the Department of Biology. I believe he's no longer. He's on sabbatical right now. Uh, I know Jeff mainly uh, from church settings. Uh, he has served as an elder at Geneva Campus Church, and I've got to know um, him mainly through that context, and I haven't really had much opportunity to interact with him here. But uh, Jeff does a lot of work as well with Biologos, which is uh, a Christian, um, well, he can tell you more about it but if he wanted to, but it's a, it's a really high-level uh, uh, faith and science uh, kind of interaction. Um, and uh, Jeff is at the heart of a lot of these big conversations on faith and science, especially on biological science. So I'll let him share a little bit more about himself, but I just wanted to, to welcome him and thank him for coming, coming this evening and sharing with us. So, yeah. Great. Well, it's, this is a dream event for me. You know, I've been wanting to come to City Reform for an awfully long time, and I just feel like, as I was telling some people at dinner, that a black hole opened up between Madison and Milwaukee when the pandemic started, and I felt like it's been hard to escape the event horizon of that black hole. And I, um, I, I've known uh, Chris for a long time, and, um, have been praying for you all as a congregation and for the, the work of this church. And uh, I, I'm just incredibly excited to be here. I do also have to say that um, when he was a wee lad in law school, Ben Verhulst was in our small group uh, at Geneva Campus Church. And um, you all are, are very blessed to have the Verhulst family in your midst. I'm sure you know that. Oh. Uh, before we get started, Chris, I wonder if you could come back up and I'll remask. And would you pray for our evening together, please? God in heaven, we give you thanks and praise for um, the opportunity to come and reflect um, on the meaning and the mystery of life, uh, the beauty and glory of the human body, fearfully and wonderfully made, um, and especially um, a human life um, in utero, in the womb. Um, we, we pray that you would um, move us and wonder, um, move us towards worship as we um, see how beautiful and complex uh, your creation is. And uh, be with uh, Jeff as he uh, helps us understand um, the complexity of the world and the, and the human body. We give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Chris. Well, um, Chris asked me to say a little bit about myself. Uh, I, it, it is true, the most important thing about me is that I'm a Christ follower and I happen to be a member of Geneva Campus Church and we have a number of Geneva alumni here and um, uh, it's what, what, what a treat it is to see the, the crosstalk between our, our two congregations. I've been at University of Wisconsin-Madison since 1991. I've been in the same department there. It used to be called zoology, now it's called integrative biology. Um, and um, I am husband of one wife, Susie, and uh, have, we have two boys, ages 33 and 35. I'll talk about my younger one a little later, my older one, John, got a in computer science at UW-Madison. My younger son is Christopher. Um, I met my wife while I was in seminary pursuing a Master of Divinity degree. Um, uh, it's, it's a long story, but instead of pursuing a career in medicine, I decided to, to take a detour, a divine detour, to uh, do a Master of Divinity degree, and I met my wife, who was at the time working for a campus ministry organization. Uh, in the summer, I was a TA for a doctrine class she was taking, and that's how we met. And then I felt the, the pull to go back into academia at UC Berkeley, where I got a PhD in biophysics, did postdoctoral work at Duke, 
and then as I said, came in 91 to Madison. Uh, I was born at Mount Sinai Hospital on the, <coughs> in, the, in Milwaukee. I, when I was a toddler, I lived in Whitefish Bay. <clears throat> and then we moved away when I was um, four years old, moved to the Washington DC area where my dad took a job down there. I came to faith in Christ as a middle schooler and um, have a varied church history in, in terms of my background, but I um, have been greatly blessed to be at Geneva Campus Church for a long time now. What I wanna talk about tonight, I think is very germane to the, the Stott lectureship um, program. And I have to say that I'm on the advisory council for the Henry Center at Trinity uh, International University, which sponsors this program, fantastic program. City Reformed, you guys are a, a, a paradigmatic church in terms of what that program is looking for. Um, people who want to think hard about the implications of their Christian faith for issues in society. And it's named after John Stott, a kind of a personal hero of mine. Uh, the work that he did after he left All Souls as the rector there in, in London to start the London um, Institute for Contemporary Christianity and thinking about how to relate to the dominant culture in the city of London, I, I think serves us well in thinking about how we might do that same kind of thing in Southern Wisconsin. All right, so uh, the topic of course is the image of God. I can't think of uh, many topics that are um, out of which we can get so much mileage when we talk about contemporary issues in our culture. And I, I really appreciate uh, what Chris has done from the pulpit to try to address some of these issues. What I wanna do tonight is to share a little bit of my own musing about some of these things. Now I know that you have some, some actual experts in the area of bioethics. We'll touch on bioethics a little bit, but I know you have some, some people at, at Brookfield CRC and here I think Gloria, I have not met you, but I recognize you behind that mask back there, so. <clears throat> Who are, are, are true experts in this area. That's not the case for me, but I, I hope um, we can think together out loud about the implications of modern developmental biology. That's the, the biology that lies behind how embryos develop. <clears throat> All right, now let's see if I can get this to work. It was working, okay, here we go. All right, so um, my younger son, Christopher, uh, has severe autism, and we go for a ride in the country on Saturdays, and I listen to audiobooks. One of the audiobooks I recently listened to was this one, maybe you read it in AP English in high school, Brave New World. And um, this was before we understood that DNA is the genetic material, and yet Aldous Huxley, the author, he got so many things right in that book about our ability to manipulate embryonic life and other stages of life. It's a chilling account of the ability to do that. And of course the, the title comes from uh, what, whoops, what Miranda says in The Tempest, how beauteous mankind is a brave new world that has such people in it. And one of the protagonists in the novel, the so-called savage, uh, likes to quote this line. Brave new world indeed. We're living in the 21st century, which is arguably the century of biology. And we have an unprecedented ability to understand the nuts and bolts of biological processes and to manipulate them technologically. Well, why should we all in this room be thinking about this? Well, as I said, it is the century of biology. You don't have to be a biologist to appreciate the key issues, and that's what I hope to convince you of tonight. In fact, it's very likely that many people here or loved ones whom you know will need to decide about these ethically challenging therapies that we're gonna consider a little bit later. But maybe more importantly, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, he doesn't say, I hope that you will be. He says, you are the salt of the earth. We are supposed to interpenetrate our culture with the good news the gospel of Jesus Christ, and to think of how that plays out in any number of societal issues. And it's not just for experts. 
The eminently quotable G.K. Chesterton said it this way, if the ordinary person may not discuss existence, why should he or she be asked to conduct it? We're all living through this, and we all need to think about it. We've been forced to do that with the pandemic, but there are other issues now that maybe, hopefully we're not gonna continue moving down the Greek alphabet, um, and maybe the pandemic is moving to an endemic. We need to return to some issues that are important. Maybe don't have the same sense of urgency but in fact, really, I would argue, are urgent for us to think about. All right, so where are we headed today? Well, first, I wanna start with some good news. It's gonna be a good news, bad news, mixed news thing, maybe. Um, let's start with wonder. I wanna talk about understanding embryonic development in a Christian context, because I think it's an opportunity for worship. And then we'll talk about the implications of what we've learned and what we've uh, learned about how to manipulate uh, human embryos and, and embryonic life in general, and try to understand that, at least in, in a very rudimentary way, from a Christian perspective. And I'll, I'll use uh, a, a thumbnail sketch of a few technologies to, to see how that plays out a little bit later. All right, so let's begin with embryos and wonder. Whoops. I'm learning how to manipulate this. This is a technology apparently I'm not mastering very well. Okay, here we go. Well, I just want you to think about the staggering challenge that is you. You, all of us, started as a one-celled zygote. That is the fertilized egg that you see up at the top here. And then some complicated stuff happens, creatively shown by the black arrow, and then you get something really complicated. This is my son Christopher, about 33, uh, 32 and a half years ago. And when you're a parent, you can't help but be amazed at the reproducibility of embryonic development. Those perfectly, or, or usually perfectly formed little digits, um, the exterior structures that you see, like the ear, um, uh, there's bilateral symmetry along the midline. There are all these things that had to happen just so. These processes are incredibly robust, and somehow a single-celled fertilized egg has to unpack and unfold all of these processes with the result that when it's all over, uh, you know, the, the numbers vary, but, but I'll, I'll use the number five trillion cells. So that's the staggering challenge faced by developmental biologists, that's what I am, people who are fascinated by the processes of embryonic development. This is not a new question. I teach the undergraduate embryonic development class at University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, developmental biology, introduction to de animal development, it's called. And on the first day of class, I point out that people have been thinking about this for a long time, including a Hebrew poet named David. And of course, here's what he said. We know this poem is Psalm 139, part of it. You formed my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I'll give thanks to you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame wasn't hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. Maybe a metaphor for the womb. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance and in your book were all written the days that were ordained for me when as yet there was not one of them. Now I point out to my students that whether they share the worldview of this Hebrew poet, and as a Christian, I tell them that I do share his worldview, whether that's true or not, I have one major goal in my class. That's that by the end of the semester, they would think embryos are cool. <laughs> and if they do, I've, I've won. That, I, my, my class has been a success. Now, uh, the, the Hebrew poet here is using some interesting language. Inward parts, well, that's the word for kidney. If you can't read Hebrew, it's okay. Um, Kalia, that's, that's uh, kidney. So he understands that there are internal organs that are part of this process. Uh, that word skillfully wrought. Uh, rakam has to do with weaving a tapestry. So it's a, it's a weaving kind of metaphor. An unformed substance is golem. J.R.R. Tolkien. It's probably where he got Gollum from, right? So, so uh, the Hebrew poet understands something fundamental. Embryonic development's a process, and we need to understand that process and how it unfolds over time as the embryo develops increasing complexity. And that's what modern developmental biologists are trying to understand. 
So let's take a whirlwind tour of human development. And um, uh, this is not a course in developmental biology, but I just want you to have an appreciation for how amazing this stuff is. Let's begin where it all starts for all of us. That's fertilization. And um, you know, fertilization is an incredibly contingent process. On average, for most humans, a single sperm has a one in 250 million chance of fertilizing an egg if you were produced in the old fashioned traditional way. That's an incredibly contingent process. Now, one of the things I appreciate about being at a reformed church, Geneva Campus Church, strong sense of providence, and this is providence in action. Each of us resulted from that incredibly contingent one in 250 million event. Now, a lot of things happen. Physiological processes are kicked into gear, and you get something like this, a zygote. And you can see that these are the nuclei, the genetic material meeting in a process called syngamy. And eventually, this fertilized egg, this zygote, is going to divide uh, and form something really complicated, as we've said. So that's called a zygote. I may use that word. That's one of the technical words I might use tonight, OK? Hopefully, you can remember that. If you can't, just hold up your hand and say, could you remind me what that word is? And I'll be happy to, to remember to turn off that expert mode. All right, so uh, the, the fertilized egg begins to divide. And it does so as it's moving down the fallopian tube, that bit of plumbing that connects the, uh, the ovary and the uterus. It's called the oviduct in some other mammals. And as it's rolling down there, this, this is, um, you, you can see it here, uh, the cells in the embryo are dividing. There's some exterior cells called follicle cells that you can see here. And it turns out that mouse embryos, very respectable mammals, look very similar to human embryos in this regard. So here's a movie of a mouse embryo dividing. And you can see this cleavage process as, as it proceeds. Two to four, and now to eight cells. Partway through the eight cell stage, the cells suck down onto one another because they produce a cellular glue that allows them to do that. Now, we're going to run this through one more time. And, and so here's four, eight cells. They're kind of loose. And now they're not loose anymore. Then eventually, more divisions occur in a fluid-filled cavity, something called the blastocele, uh, uh, forms in the middle of this embryo. And we'll talk about some cells that are formed as a result of these division processes, which are called cleavage divisions, in a moment, because some very specialized cells are, are formed at the end of this. At the end of this process, we get this structure. This is called a blastocyst. This is another technical word. I think you can handle it, though. I'm confident. And um, the blastocyst has some specialized cells up here. It's about a three-day-old human embryo. And here's this fluid-filled cavity, which is called the blastocele. These cells are called the inner cell mass. And they are very special, as we will see. They are very developmentally flexible. They can turn into all kinds of different things. And uh, that's what made you, at least the part of you that was left behind after you were born. So the baby comes from this region of the embryo. Well, there's some, some membranes. They're kind of like giant balloons. They're filled with fluid. There's one called the amnion, which is the, the thing that breaks when we say that uh, a mother's water breaks when she's about to, to go into labor. Um, that's time to get to the hospital. And um, then there's another sac called the yolk sac underneath. But if you look at the part of the embryo that's going to form a baby much later, it looks like this. It's a flat disk. And cells stream into the, the interior along a line here. And that's called the primitive streak. That process by which all of these cells are moving in an incredibly complicated choreographic, choreographed movement of cells is called gastrulation. And that's something that, that I've been interested in since my PhD days, something my lab has been interested in. Now, it's hard to study that in, in humans for obvious reasons. But here's a frog embryo. And I happen to be the Raymond E. Keller Professor of Integrated Biology. Don't get too impressed by that, except who you should be impressed by is Raymond E. Keller. He was my PhD advisor. And my professorship is named after Ray. And so this is um, a movie from his lab. Actually, this guy, Dave Shook, I was a teaching assistant at Berkeley. He was a freshman taking intro 
biology and then later went on to do great things like making these movies. So here's a frog embryo and you can see there are cells streaming in around a, a circle. The whole embryo is going to get longer from top to bottom as the head to tail or anterior posterior axis develops. Really complicated stuff. Thousands of cells moving in highly directional fashion and in a coordinated way. It's remarkable. Here are some mouse embryos. They've been genetically engineered, so they produce glowing proteins. That's the magenta and the green here. And let's just run this forward. And you can see the, the pink stuff's getting longer in these two embryos. It's green in this embryo over here uh, as the head to tail axis of the, the mouse embryo begins to emerge. That's gastrulation in action. Pretty incredible. Well, after that, we all looked like a burrito. Uh, it's, it's a neurula stage embryo, and you can see that here. Uh, the opening of the central nervous system at the anterior and the posterior are called neuropores. And eventually, this thing here is going to form a tube which will become the rudiment of the spinal cord. This is a very important milestone in embryonic development. So uh, the neural tube is, is the hallmark of that process. So let's go back to some amphibians. These are now salamander embryos, but you'll get the idea. I like this movie. Here we go. What's going on? You can see that there are these folds that are rising up and meeting along the midline. This is on the, on the back side of the embryo. And uh, so a flat sheet is rolling up into a tube. That's the whole burrito thing that I was mentioning a moment ago. It's remarkable. This process of bodybuilding is called morphogenesis, and that's what my lab has been interested in for my whole career. Well, eventually, uh, starting with all of these rudimentary structures that were established during gastrulation and neurulation, organ systems form. And here is a developing fetus. You can see the eyes here. You can see the paddles, which are eventually going to be the feet down here. This is something called a limb bud. The brain vesicles are forming here. Lots of other organ rudiments are well on their way to forming the, the organs that you know and love and that some of you were wearing descriptors of on the back of your, your shirts tonight, I noticed. And I don't know about you, but I don't know if somebody handpicked the particular body parts that were matched to particular people, but it was uh, pretty good. I, anybody still have their, their label on their back? Do you know what it says? Stomach. Stomach. Is art imitating life there or not? <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> All of those organ systems form after that basic body plan is established. And that's what got me hooked. I was at UC Berkeley. I was not liking my PhD program at all. I, I was really questioning God's call in my life in some ways. And I hated my first lab rotation, which involved um, dissecting uh, frog eyes in the dark and mounting a piece of tissue in, a, in a, an instrument. I just didn't like it. And I thought, well, what, what course did I like a lot in college? Oh, I love that embryonic development course. I wonder if there's somebody in the biophysics program who actually works with embryos. There was one guy, and that was Ray Keller, the guy I mentioned before. And he said, well, I work on frogs, but I think you should work on sea urchin embryos, and that's what you're looking at here. And I saw one of these embryos under the microscope, and the first time I saw one, I was absolutely hooked. That was my path to wonder. Now we use a different model organism. And the idea here is that you can learn a lot about a Mercedes by studying a Toyota. And um, so sea urchins are one uh, economy car. This is a nematode worm, something called Cenorhabditis elegans, or C. elegans. That's what my lab works on mostly these days. But we, we can genetically engineer these embryos so they express glowing proteins. And we can use fancy computer-controlled microscopes to watch what they're doing. So that's what my lab does for fun and maybe not so much profit. And, um, but we're trying to understand the individual cells, which you can see here, these blocky structures are single cells in a living embryo, trying to understand what proteins they need to do what they do. So that's what my lab does. So that's a little bit about the basics of the biology. And it's an opportunity for us to worship, to stand in amazement. We really are fearfully 
and wonderfully made. But as I said, the same powerful technologies that my lab and many other labs across the world are using to unlock the secrets of the embryo allow us to manipulate embryos. And that means that we have to think about the implications of what we've learned about embryonic development. And for the purposes of this Stott lecture, or the, this uh, Stott series at City Reformed, we want to think explicitly about how the image of God informs our thinking about human embryos. At this point, the practical theologian in our house, her name is Susie, my wife, as you can see here, would say, Harden, wait a minute. Yeah, that's nice. Okay, those movies are cool, I'll give you that. But haven't you taken all of the, the, the mystery out of embryonic development? So she'd say, at this point, life's a miracle. You've robbed it of that sense that I had, that it's a miracle. How dare you do that? And you know, there's maybe a danger of that. The, the problem is one of reductionism, thinking we can understand an embryo by breaking it down into its component parts, messing with particular genes, and seeing what happens, those kinds of things. That is what my lab does. But I've never had that sense that understanding embryos in a detailed way robs me of the wonder of embryonic development. And I'm not alone. This is Charles Kingsley, and he said this in the 19th century. He's a British theologian. Now, he was thinking about uh, evolutionary biology, but I think this applies to embryos really well. Are we to reverence him, that's God, less or more, if we hear that his might is greater, his wisdom deeper than we ever dreamed? We knew of old that God was so wise that he could make all things, but behold, he's so much wiser than even that, that he can make all things make themselves. That's exactly what embryos do. Each of us is a self-made person. And understanding those processes don't rob me of the sense of wonder. In fact, they deepen my sense of wonder and my amazement at the embryo. Well, we're gonna talk about some ethics. Let me recommend a few books, and Gloria may be a great resource here. Um, and I, uh, I, Gloria ha, ha, is a past president of the Christian Medical Dental Association, which has an enormous number of high quality online resources in areas that relate to what I'm gonna talk about tonight. I strongly urge you, well, first of all, to get to know Gloria better than you, maybe you do. And I, would, I know I would like that. And then, um, but also please look at the CMDA website. But here are a few books that I've personally found helpful. One is by Gil Mylander, a Lutheran bioethicist at Valparaiso University. It's in its fourth edition. It's just called Bioethics. Good non-technical introduction, like it a lot. Uh, this is a good historical introduction if you really want to dive into the history of Christian thinking about embryos um, by Colin McKellar. And uh, this is kind of a multiple voices view. I don't agree with everything in this volume, but everyone writing in this volume is super thoughtful. It's called God and the Embryo. And as I said, uh, at Brookfield CRC is uh, Fabrice Jotteron, and he's at a medical college of Wisconsin. He's a bioethicist. And um, Gloria, sorry, I, I did put your name on here, so you're a marked woman. Okay. Well, all right, so we need to think about the ethical implications of embryos. Maybe biology will serve us really well. I'm a biologist, great place to start. Remember we said that we start as a one-celled zygote and then we get something like my son Christopher here on the lower right. What can we say about this? Well, as we trace the life history of a single individual, it's the same individual throughout all of these stages of development. The biology is very clear about that. Once we have a fertilized egg, a zygote, its internal processes, given a suitable environment, allow it to unfold in just this way, and that's what happened for all of us. So we can say with the Ramsey Colloquium that the embryo is human. Any being that is human is a human being. If it's objected that at five days or 15 days, the embryo doesn't look like a human being, it has to be pointed out that this is precisely what a human being looks like and what each of us looked like at five or 15 days of development. Don't be deceived by the dissimilarity, at least superficially, of an organism at these different stages of its development. The biology is really clear on that. 
So there's continuity of biological life from fertilization to birth. And that alone ought to make us reluctant to perturb embryos, to intentionally destroy them. So here's Gil Myland, I've mentioned him before. If we're generally baffled about how best to describe the moral status of that human subject who's the unimplanted embryo, that's a really early embryo, we should not go forward in a way that peculiarly combines metaphysical bewilderment with practical certitude by approving even limited use for experimental purposes. What Gill's saying is, look, we need to give this organism the benefit of the doubt, even if we don't have any other criteria for assessing the value of a human individual at different stages of its development. And I'll call that the wisdom of reluctance. And that's, that's a place where we can be in dialogue with people who don't share our Christian worldview in the culture. Now, we can ask though, is biology enough? Biology can tell us a lot of things and especially allows us to debunk a lot of silly kinds of statements that some people tend to make when they're not thinking about the biology. But Sandra Wheeler brings up an important point. If we're looking for value, value is not going to be easily identified under the microscope. We can't go looking for moral status or value as if it were a feature we might locate under a microscope, if only we had one powerful enough. Understanding the biology helps us to rule out silly arguments about the value of human individuals, but value needs to be rooted in something different from the biology. Natural science doesn't have inherent in it, baked into it, valuation systems. that the value question is crucial is exemplified by this gentleman in an era before lots of clickbait and um, lots of click throughs in social media, Peter Singer was eminently quotable and I think he said things just to be outrageous sometimes, but here's one thing he said in this respect, comparing a, a mouse to a human embryo, experimenting on a human embryo is not to be compared in significance with experimenting on a living sentient mouse. I don't know about you, but when I read a statement like this, it seems wrong. And in fact, for many of my students, this seems wrong. And yet for many of my students, they don't have a grounding that provides an ethical basis for evaluating why this statement is wrong. And that's where being Christians is incredibly valuable. And uh, here is a Christian geneticist, he's passed away. This is V. Elving Anderson. Elving said this, what inner resources will the individuals have for coping with future discoveries in this area of biotechnology? It's sometimes claimed that questions of the future will be so unique that old values will be inadequate. But I've found any basic questions, I've not found any basic questions that will not profit from consideration of a biblical perspective. And you know, I think Elving, is absolutely right. The Bible provides us with some key insights to help us think about modern technologies, even though it's an ancient book. And you've been learning about this at City Reform, so I don't wanna belabor things too much. In particular, you've been spending a lot of time on this single bullet up here, especially Genesis chapter one and Genesis chapter two have key things to say about the, the nature of humans as image bearers. We are bearing the image, the stamp of our king. And Jesus is the ultimate image bearer. He bears the image of the father. We bear Jesus' image. And that is a key, uh, crucial biblical criterion for what it means to be human. Humans also act as stewards as we learn from Genesis chapters one and two as well. They procreate in one flesh relationships this is all in the first two chapters of Genesis. And uh, we, we learn uh, throughout the entire Bible that children really are begotten gifts. Psalm 127 talks about, blessed is the person whose arrow, his quiver is full of them, and it, likening children to arrows, right? I've often wondered about that metaphor and whether, how we should unpack that, but you get the idea that children are meant to be a blessing. They're gifts. And the Bible is really clear, and I think unique in many ways, um, 
in terms of ancient Near Eastern literature and uh, Greco-Roman literature in emphasizing that the weak deserve special protection. And there are many passages in the Old Testament that exemplify this. We've looked at Psalm 139 already. That's just one passage among many that, that seems to indicate the Bible understands there's a continuity between an embryo and a more fully formed human. And those embryos who become more fully formed humans are part of God's plan. If you look at the calling of several of the prophets, they've been called from the womb. And um, maybe you remember from the birth narratives of Jesus, especially in the Gospel of Luke, uh, the embryonic Jesus and the embryonic John the Baptist seem to have a thing going. And um, we might debate what that thing is exactly, but it's clear that there's personal identity in the uterus, in utero. So all of that, the preponderance, uh, the, the inference from all of that then is that, remember that wisdom of reluctance that we were talking about with, with Gil Mylander? Um, as Christians, that, that should add to our reluctance. However, it's also reasonable, I think, to say that the human biblical authors did not know about a blastocyst or a zygote. Not in detail, clearly couldn't have known that. And that's because the Bible is a pre-scientific document. And that means its language is simply not going to be as precise as we might like. Maybe not going to give us the certainty that, that we would wish for. And it's just true that there are sincere Christians, Christians um, who are seeking to be faithful to God, who disagree on several issues relating to very early human embryos. I think what we can say, though, is that the passages we've looked at may not establish when human life begins. The biology does just fine for that. As I go, is the point at which most people would say we have a human organism. But they do establish God's care and involvement from the very beginning. That's good language. All right, now there's some other things that inform a biblical worldview about this. And this forces us, I think, to engage in a balancing act. So what do I mean? Well, first of all, we should desire to use technology to prevent disease. That's, if you want a fancy word for that, we might use the word beneficence. But based on what I've said, we should seek to treat the embryo as a patient if we're going to intervene in the life of an embryo. And that means that the embryo should be treated as an end in his or herself versus as a means to some other greater good. One thing I think Christians throughout the centuries have had a healthy respect for is the limits of technology. Technological optimism, I'll call that the Star Trek view of the world, something we have to guard against. You know, Star Trek, anybody watch Star Trek? Thank you for admitting that, I appreciate that, I do too. Um, and you know, the thing about Star Trek that drives me nuts is it's, it's really not dystopian, right? On planet Earth, technology has helped us to lick poverty, disease, we don't even need money anymore. Wow, man, don't even need monetary systems at all. That's all because of technology. The Bible would say, no, I don't think so. Technology has its benefits, but also its liabilities, and that's because of human limitations. And those human limitations begin in Genesis 2, before the badness of Genesis chapter 3, something we often call the fall. Before that, God tells Adam and Eve, hey, I'm placing some limits on you. Don't eat of this particular tree. There are going to be very deleterious consequences. Limitations can be part of human flourishing. But of course, things go from um, reasonable to, to much worse in Genesis chapter 3. And the introduction of human sinfulness and disobedience makes the uses of technology all that much more prone to misuse. And that means that for Christians, the goal of beneficence will be in tension with uh, a need to seek restraints on the use of technology. All right, so that's all we can talk about tonight. 
But I just want to bring out one other point. And um, you know, one of the things I really appreciate about your senior pastor is he knows how to think theologically. And uh, of course, one of the things that we affirm in uh, our Christian faith is that Jesus became one of us. Our story became his story. The Apostles' Creed, of course, says it this way. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. That's embryonic development right there. Jesus, by becoming a human, God, the second person of the Trinity becoming human, has dignified the processes of embryonic development that gave rise to each one of us. That is profound. Lucy Shaw, in a poem I really like called Made Flesh, said it this way, after the bright beam of enunciation fused heaven with dark earth, his searing, sharply focused light went out for a while, eclipsed in amniotic gloom. His cool immensity of splendor, his universal grace, small folded in a warm, dim female space. This is part of Jesus' willingness to become one of us for us so that we might be united with him in eternity. And maybe, maybe Chris can probably help you to think about this more deeply than I can, um, but uh, several people make this point that a, a kind of traditional thinking about who Jesus is, that's a subject called Christology, probably forces us to recognize that Jesus was who he is from the time that he was a one-celled fertilized egg a zygote. And um, so I've already mentioned this book, it kind of makes that case in a historical way, so does this one. And then uh, this is by a, a theologian named Oliver Crisp, kind of a rogue, reformed theologian. I don't know, Ben might, uh, do you like Oliver? You don't even know him, okay. <laughs> well, I, and it's kind of a spooky looking cover, but anyway, he, may, he basically makes that same argument. And because our story became his story, it became our story when we were embryos too. Thomas Torrance, very famous Presbyterian Scottish theologian said, in becoming a human being for us, Jesus also became an embryo for the sake of all embryos. I really like that. So that's the backdrop. Let's quickly then look at four different examples. I'm gonna do my best to keep the details down. Right? I probably won't succeed entirely, but that's okay. Um, Chris and I can talk about me posting materials for further study and a reading list, if that would be helpful. I didn't do that because I wanted you to look, look at me and look up at what we're doing up here rather than look at a handout. So, so uh, but I'm happy to provide that or, or come back for a small group discussion or what, whatever it might be. All right, so let's look at some examples. First example is something called pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. Very powerful technique for determining the genotype, the basic f flavors of genes that might be important uh, and that are known to lead to particular human disease states. This is possible because embryos are incredibly resilient, and this is one of my heroes of embryology. Uh, this is a guy named Hans Triesch. I have a German degree, kind of a closet degree from my undergrad. I got a degree in zoology and another one in German. And so his writing is just really great. It's from the late 19th century. And he was working with sea urchin embryos. That's what I started working on. And he figured out a way to remove calcium from seawater, causes the cells of an embryo to fall apart. And you can separate the cells, put them in a dish with regular seawater, and they'll continue developing. So that was the basic thing that he was doing. So he took a four cell sea urchin embryo and he did that. He took all four cells, separated them, put them into separate dishes, and then he waited to see what would happen. Now normally each of these cells would make one quarter of the sea urchin larva, which looks like a spaceship called a pluteus. That's but what he found was instead when he separated the cells, now each one of them made a perfectly proportioned pluteus larva, the little spaceships down on the bottom. Whoa. So by changing the conditions, he radically changed what the cells were going to turn into. That's called conditional specification. The environment 
help to determine the decisions that the cells made in terms of what they were going to turn into later. Remarkable. Well, Dries was so flummoxed by this that, and he despaired of ever being able to understand this through scientific methodologies that he became a philosopher. <laughs> it's true, he became the most famous example of something called vitalism in the 20th century. Yeah, true story. All right, well, it turns out that, that our development is conditional as well. Is anybody a monozygotic twin in the room, a so-called identical twin, anybody? One, excellent. Now they're not identical, that's why we don't like to use that word, but the, the notion of twinning of this sort gives you these amazing girls here. And that's because of splitting of the embryo at a stage prior to the time of gastrulation where that line, that primitive streak forms that I mentioned earlier on. And this can happen at progressively later stages. But you can see that it's the same thing that Dries was studying, isn't it? You don't get a half of a human, you get a whole human. Beautiful ones at that. This is the basis for pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. In the old days, what was old? 20 years ago? Um, you could remove a cell of an eight cell embryo, that's what's being done here. The remaining seven cells will figure it out and they will develop into a human if this embryo is implanted in uh, the uterus of a woman. And then you can take this cell and do genetic testing on it. That's how it was originally done. Now it's done in a different way. Now uh, uh, a group of cells from something called the, the trophoblast or trophectoderm are removed. It's a little safer to do it this way. It's the same basic idea. So genetic testing can be done. Um, and uh, sometimes the embryo is frozen while the results of the test are, are being uh, returned to the family that's engaging in this technology. Well, seems great, right? I mean, after all, wow, we could determine based on other criteria that we might know about, which often has to do with the genetics of the family of the parents involved, that uh, we could use this technology to determine whether an embryo has two bad copies of a particular kind of gene, or sometimes one bad copy if it's a particular sort of gene. And um, this would maybe allow us to treat the embryo or do something uh, with it. Uh, one thing you can use this for is sex selection. You can test for Y chromosomes. So if you're looking for boys, uh, which is usually how it works, unfortunately, um, you, you could use it for this purpose. This has led to imbalance in, um, uh, due to sex selection in uh, a few countries across the world. But uh, typically, the problem here is that pre-implantation genetic diagnosis involves the intentional destruction of embryos that don't have the right genetic constitution, the right genotype. So it might be possible to use it as a diagnostic tool, but usually that's not how it's used. Usually, if you've got the wrong genotype, then the embryo is, is destroyed. You can see that that might be ethically problematic. So alternatives should be sought that don't involve embryo destruction. There is maybe not as quite as good an alternative, and it's really hard to do this, is something called polar body biopsy. It turns out that when eggs are dividing in the ovary, a little nubbin is formed during one of the divisions that are part of what's known as meiosis called a polar body. All you need to know is that that thing has DNA in it. You can slurp that off of an egg. It hasn't been fertilized, it's an egg. So it's not an embryo. Then you can genetically test that, that little thing, that's this, this little guy here. And if you get the right result, then you can determine that the egg has good copies of the gene of interest. Then you could do in vitro fertilization if you think that's okay. We haven't talked about that, but many people would think that that potentially could be permissible. And then you could implant that resulting embryo. So you never had to destroy an embryo with this technology. The problem here, is that it's rarely practiced and very difficult. Now, I've thought about this topic of genetic diagnosis a lot. Um, my son Christopher has autism here. Here he is in Madison last summer or last fall. And uh, autism has a strong genetic component. There are many other things that are, contribute 
to autism. It's very clear. About 30% of the or maybe more um, in general in the population is genetically based. Let's say we had a test for that. And let's say that we had engaged in uh, PGD. How would I felt about that? Well, my wife Susie and I have thought a lot about that. We can't imagine Christopher not being in our family. This is where being a Christian makes a big difference. Christopher's name means Christ bearer or Christ carrier. We never thought in naming him Christopher that what that might mean is that by learning to care for Christopher, we would be brought closer to Jesus. That he would bear Christ to us through us learning to care for him. And he's been an incredible blessing to our family. My wife was on hot tub duty tonight while I'm here at City Reformed. I normally, that's, that's what I do on uh, uh, Sunday evenings with him. All right, so that's one example. Example number two is something called chimeric embryos. What are those? Maybe you remember some Greek mythology. Chimera is a mixed animal that has characteristics of different animals, kind of freaky. Um, embryos call uh, chimeras a mixture of cells of different types. The most mind-blowing example of this, I think, is from mice. Well, it also works in other mammals, as you'll see momentarily. Remember that at the eight cell stage, the, cell, uh, the cells in the embryo start making a glue, and they eventually compact. They become very tightly packed. You can take three different mouse embryos before that happens, push them together. They will make that cellular glue, and they will unite into a single embryo. Freaky. <laughs> so that's what you get here. Three embryos, one, two, three. They're kind of all mixed together. This is a blastocyst. It's got a whopping load of inner cell mast cells, those cells at the end of the blastocyst. Uh, but that thing will make a perfectly respectable mouse. And it's, it's a chimera. So if these three embryos have different genetic constitutions, like they have different hair color, you can discern that in the resulting mouse. So here we go. Here are three inbred mouse strains, three different coat colors. Here's a chimeric mouse made in the way that we saw on the previous slide. Now, the, whoops, this guy's a little bit bigger. I don't think that's a result of the chimeric procedure. <laughs> um, if it works in a mouse, it's almost always going to work in a primate. Proof positive, next slide, cover of cell. One of the journals I read a lot. Chimeric primates can be made in this same way. This um, macaque was made from six originating embryos. Freaky. So the embryo has a way of figuring out what its cells should turn into. Why am I talking about this? This is not just to amaze undergraduates, is it, after all? What's going on? Well, we can make chimeras in a different way by squirting cells of one type that are normally part of the inner cell mass into a blastocyst stage embryo. It's, it's a different way of doing this experiment. And this is how this experiment has been done in the, in the particular way that I want to describe on the next slide. And that's to make this embryo. What is this? This is a pig fetus. The red cells are human cells that were introduced using the technology on the previous slide. This is a mixture of pig and human cells. Now, most of the human cells have populated a particular organ rudiment. This is a four-week-old pig fetus. Why would we want to do this? Well, here's the idea. We can, we can um, genetically edit the, the DNA of pigs so that they don't mount an immune reaction to human cells. Moreover, imagine we could make a genetically engineered pig that can't make a particular organ rudiment, and we can actually do that. Now we'll put in human cells into this pig. They'll populate the, the missing organ, make that organ, but it'll be composed entirely of human cells. Maybe we could use those human tissues then in organ donation experiments. That's, that was the original intent. And so that's what's being done here. So you can see this actually works. And the human cells will form the organ. 
This has also been done with humans and monkeys. And that's what you see here. Uh, uh, Giancarlo Espasua Belmonte's lab did this in San Diego. And um, so this technology is, is possible. I think you can probably imagine there are lots of reasons why we maybe would not want to do this. At least I'm not persuaded there are any really good reasons for ever trying to do this. Here, but don't take it from me, take it from people smarter than me. The, the National Academy of Sciences in 2005, before this was ever actually done, said these kinds of studies could produce creatures in which the lines between human and non-human primates are blurred, a development that could threaten to undermine human dignity. Yeah, no kidding. Especially problematic, as you can imagine, would be if brain tissues involved. Whoa. And some of the experiments have been done in a way where neuronal tissue uh, nerve cells could, could get into the brains of these chimeras. Now, the embryos have been destroyed, but you can see the problems here. But more importantly, as a Christian, theologically, humans are image-bearing creatures that are distinct from the rest of the created order. We share a lot with other primates, but the biblical witness testifies to our uniqueness. So there's just no good reasons for doing this experiment. And so we should seek alternatives, like something called organoid technology, which I'll talk about next. All right, example number three, <clears throat> human embryonic stem cells. Remember that you looked like this at a certain stage in your development. That's called a blastocyst. We all looked like that. It turns out that the clump of cells at the top of that picture are called inner cell mass cells, and they are very developmentally flexible. And this gentleman, who is one of my colleagues at UW Madison, developed the technology to culture these cells in a dish, starting from human embryos. These are then called human embryonic stem cells. Now, Jamie Thompson is a very thoughtful man. Here's what he said a long time ago in a really great piece in the New York Times Magazine. If human embryonic stem cell research does not make you at least a little bit uncomfortable, you've not thought about it enough. Well, why is that? It's because of what's involved in making these stem cells. What's done is to take a human blastocyst created through in vitro fertilization, and the, the standard way that this was done for many, many years, there are other ways to do this, but is to use antibodies which attack the outside of the embryo, cause the exterior cells to fall apart, this allows you to take these inner cell mass cells, these guys at the bottom here, put them in a dish, and they have an amazing property. They divide like crazy, and you can coax them to form a very large number of specialized tissues. That's what makes them so special. That <clears throat> incredible flexibility means that they are what is known as pluripotent stem cells. But the problem here is, of course, this first step, we're destroying an embryo. And based on what I've said before, alternatives would be desirable. So ES cells, good or bad? Well, production of new ES cells always involves intentional destruction of embryos. So what are there alternatives? Well, it turns out there's an exciting technology, which is an alternative. This due to this guy, Shinya Yamanaka got a Nobel Prize. Uh, for his work on what's called induced pluripotency. This is a way, it's basically cellular alchemy. You can cause any old cells, like cells from your skin, to produce four proteins they don't normally make. And this sets them on a genetic trajectory that makes them these super flexible cells. And so they, they behave just like uh, embryonic stem cells, but there was no embryo involved. So these proteins are called Yamanaka factors most of the time these days. And these induced pluripotent cells behave in a way that's extremely similar to embryonic stem cells. Uh, it's pretty clear that the best iPS cells are as good as embryonic stem cells. At least it seems clear to me. So that's great, right? I mean, after all, we, we had this great technology no embryos involved, and we get these flexible cells. And that is great. And maybe one day, if you have a disease, we might harvest some cells from you, turn them into these induced pluripotent cells, 
then cause them to, to become specialized to replace the tissues that you have lost. And they're exactly matched to you genetically. Really exciting. But the technology has other uses as well. It turns out that iPS cells are so flexible that you can put a bunch of them together and you can coax them to make things that look a lot like embryos. That general class of such things are called embryoids. Um, but I just wanna, here's a couple of examples. This guy on the left is something called an eye blastoid. It looks like a blastocyst. Whoa, this is mind blowing. I mean, it's got inner cell mast cells up here. It's got this fluid filled cavity down here. This guy over here is called a gastroloid. Remember, I like studying gastrulation. These cells are, are gastrulating, basically. This looks an awful lot like a mouse embryo. This is, these are mouse cells. But human-induced pluripotent cells will do this exact same thing. Now, people working on this, notice this. Wow, he's looking an awful lot like embryos. Wait, wait a minute. What are we doing? And so one group from the University of Michigan said this, we have to be careful using the term synthetic human embryo because some people are not happy about it. <laughs> no kidding. So there are ethical challenges, there are, eth there are opportunities technologically, but recognize that often technological opportunities come with ethical challenges that we all have to work through. All right, finally, very briefly, let's talk about editing the DNA of human embryos. And I'm, a, I'm a little short on time, I'll, I'll get through this quickly. What is genome editing? All you need to know is it's a molecular scissors. We can take a stretch of DNA, which provides the information to make molecules in a cell, and we can edit that DNA so that the embryo makes different things. My lab uses this all the time to genome edit worm embryos. But this works great in primates too. So all you need to know is that there's this molecular scissors attractively shown by the scissor icon up at the top. Yeah, that's great. It's kind of like your word processor. You hit command C and it cuts out DNA. You can do command V, pastes in some DNA, basically like that. And we can edit the genome. We know the sequence of building blocks of DNA throughout the entire human genome, and we can do this with human cells. Now currently there's some technological problems. It's not 100% foolproof, so the snipping doesn't always occur exactly where you want it. That's something called off-target effects. But the technology is moving very fast. We're probably going to solve that in not too uh, long of a time period. The basic technology uses something called CRISPR-Cas9 technology. It's a form of genome editing. And it's very simple, it turns out. Any lab can basically do this. A really talented group at Oregon Health Sciences University, uh, and this is the group leader, uh, Dr. Mitpolitov, showed that they could do this first with monkeys, but then with humans. And this was uh, announced in 2017. And they did an edit that you might want to do. This is in a gene which encodes a protein, provides the information to make a protein that's important for muscle development and uh, sometimes causes teenage athletes to die from a heart attack due to cardiomyopathy. So the idea was to show that you could do this with a gene you actually might want to use in a therapeutic intervention. They did this on human embryos, and then they destroyed the experiment. They didn't allow the embryos to develop. Now, uh, based on what we said earlier, you might find this ethically problematic, the destruction. Now, the bombshell came not too long after this. This is He Jian Qi from uh, Southern University of Science and Technology in China. And he was the first to announce that he had performed genome editing on embryos that were carried to term, resulting in babies. Uh, I should point out, uh, whoops, why was he doing this experiment? Well, that's not clear. The experiment that he did was to make a genome edit in a cell surface protein that might make the girls in whose, uh, whose genomes were edited 
resistant to infection with the human immunodeficiency virus, the, the virus that causes AIDS. But no one found the, the rationale convincing in any way. My friend Francis Collins, who started the BioLogos Foundation and until recently was the director of the National Institutes of Health, um, said this at the time. This was profoundly unfortunate, ill-considered, an epic scientific misadventure that flouted international ethical norms and was largely carried out in secret with utterly unconvincing justifications. I don't think Francis could have been any clearer about <laughs> how he felt and I think how many of us felt. And this led to a moratorium on the kinds of experiments that her engaged in in 2019. So right now the pause button has been hit, but I don't expect the pause button to be hit for very long. And you need to know that. People will begin to do genome editing and they will do it in the germline to allow human embryos to come to term that have been genome edited and that can pass on the edits in their own cells to their offspring when they become reproductively mature and become parents. Well, what about this? Well, right now, uh, the current approaches can't guarantee that there won't be off-target effects, so it's not safe. That's what we can say right now. The problem is when you edit the DNA of an embryo, it's going to get in the cells that make the sperm or the eggs, so it's going to be permanent and passed on to future generations. As we've seen, current approaches involve frequent embryo destruction. Problem. And this raises the specter of what's called eugenics, that we can somehow manipulate the human genome to make better humans in some way that many of us would find deeply troubling. And there are going to be other temptations. This is the eminently quotable George Church, molecular biologist at the Broad Institute. MIT Harvard, he said this, if these fixes for severe diseases are shown to be safe and effective, why would small or large enhancements accompanying the fixes be unacceptable? So Church is saying, if we can make this safe, why wouldn't we, once we popped open the molecular hood, so to speak, wouldn't we go in and make a few other modifications that would somehow make, make humans better? There's going to be a tremendous pull towards attempts at this kind of enhancement. And remember, I talked about Brave New World at the beginning. Uh, normally, de-enhancement is not talked about, but it's possible. Ultimately, the key issue here is the one that your Stott Fellowship Program is addressing. What does it mean to be human? Jennifer Doudna, one of the Nobel Prize recipients for work on CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing technology, said it this way, really moving piece. She recounts the story. She says this, one woman, the mother of a child with Down syndrome, explained, I love my child and wouldn't change him. There's something about him that's so special. Dowden at that point teared up as she told this story and she said this, it makes you think hard about what it means to be human, doesn't it? That's the key question. That's why this sermon series is crucially important. That's why what you're doing here at City Reformed is crucially important so that you can think well about these issues. Well, fearfully and wonderfully made indeed. What are some next steps for us? First of all, be informed. You don't have to be a PhD level biologist to understand the basic gist of key technological advancements. You just don't have to have that kind of training. It's up to people like me to boil it down for you so that, that you can understand it, but I, I know you can do it. This is a very bright group. Be critical thinkers. Remember that Star Trek view of the world? We have to resist that. Technology needs to be used thoughtfully given all the provisos about the human condition that are informed by our biblical worldview. Third, once you've done those things, be loving advocates. It's easy to not be loving in our current cultural moment. I think we all understand that. Got to resist that. Flaming people on Twitter, maybe not the best way to move discussions forward. And finally, be profoundly Christian. 
I'm sure what uh, Chris and Council of City Reformed are hoping for from, from this series, what I'm praying for, is that you wouldn't just be nice. I mean, being nice is great. But be profoundly Christian and be loving from a, a thoughtful Christian perspective. If you develop that kind of a perspective, people are going to take you seriously as you think about and talk about these issues, and I hope you do. All right, thanks very much. I'm sorry I went a little over time. I did have to introduce myself at the beginning, <laughs> so I just wanna say mea culpa on that. Thank you very much. Yeah, so the question is, what are some good places to go for keeping up on the technology? Yeah, the CMDA website is good, I think. Um, one place. Um, a place that sometimes evaluates recent technologies is actually comes out of the Southern Baptist Convention. Maybe not a group that uh, folks in this room would normally think of, but. Um, uh, a, 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 a part of the Southern Baptist Convention called the ERLC, often does bioethics stuff. Uh, I like that. Um, actually, the easiest way to keep up on a lot of the technologies are through long format news articles in, in the places that you're used to going. Things like the New York Times, the Atlantic Monthly, uh, and the major reputable news websites. That's harder though. To be honest, I think Christians need to do a bit better job of rolling out reviews of the latest bombshell that just came out in the journal Nature two weeks ago. We need to do a bit better job of that. Maybe, some, maybe I need to be part of that, if you want my opinion about that. So what I can do is to provide a list of URLs that, that I've personally found helpful, and maybe we can, we can uh, post those. Um, I know I have a, a piece that's coming out in an edited book through something called the Center for Pastor Theologians, which Chris knows about. Um, that book is coming out soon. That mentions some of the technologies I talked about today. It's gonna be hard for you to find it for a while. So, so maybe I can be part of the solution there. Okay, so I'm thinking about your example three. Can you go back to that slide? Oh. I will try recognizing that I'm challenged with this. You, oh, it looks like I'm figuring it out. That's good. Yeah. And are you like what happens? Okay. It's a great question. Um, first of all, there's a there's a rule which I think is a purely pragmatic rule put in place that would allow embryo experimentation to proceed called the 14 day rule. This was the idea that you would not let a human embryo progress past 14 days of development in vitro in a dish. People, the first thing I want to say is many people are pushing to remove the 14-day boundary. Obviously, if you believe you have a, a, an ethic, a morally important entity from fertilization, that was a meaningless boundary to you before, but uh, there are, are a number of people in the United Kingdom, for example, where this rule was originally developed that push strongly for that 14A rule because they feel it provides us with some sort of societal consensus about embryos. Um, why am I saying that? So these particular embryos could not really possibly develop into a functioning human organism. But as we imp improve this technology, I'm not so sure what's gonna happen, <clears throat> to be honest. So you could get something that looks really good. And so some people are saying right now, well, you know, these things, they're not really embryos, so we can extend the 14-day rule and do, kind of do whatever we want with them. They're kind of the George Church, that eminently quotable guy I mentioned earlier, he calls them the off-road vehicles of human embryo experimentation. I just don't, I just have a lot of trouble with that. Um, so, um, 
What is being done is to develop gastroloids that don't have the anterior part of the central nervous system, so they can't make a functioning brain, human brain. So then you could look at something from the neck down in terms of basic like gastrulation and neurulation down here, some on the back end. Um, but I think what we've seen in this area is that scientists, there are a lot of scientists who just want to see what would happen. They're, they're not like the mad scientists, you know, like Victor Frankenstein or something like that. That was another book I read on my long drives with Christopher, interesting book. And, um, um, but they are, they just want to, they're just curious, like, let's just see what these guys can do, you know, if we put them through their paces. And I'm really concerned about that. I feel like there's been totally inadequate ethical discussion about the moral status of these entities. Now, that's a mouse embryo. I believe this one's a mouse as well. So there, you don't have the, the ethical qualms. But I'm really concerned about it. Yeah. Are we in the age of that hasn't already happened? Like, has it been uh, uh, yeah. The, Right now, so in the United States, you can do any experiments you want with these kinds of cells or with any human embryo you want as long as you have private money to do it. Like right now in the US, the US, we like our freedoms, right? We know that in many areas and maybe we don't all agree about with regard to personal protective equipment and some firearms and things like that. So we don't all agree about that. But you understand the ethos in the US. That actually covers our bioethics, too. We, uh, if you can get private funding for your work, there are no legal prohibitions at the federal level at any rate. You often can't get federal government funding to do the research, but if you're privately funded, you could do it. Now, states are, are passing laws of various sorts in any number of areas that we've discussed tonight. Um, many states are passing more restrictive rules about Abortion, as you know, uh, Texas was the first to, to do that, and then that was challenged all the way to the Supreme Court, and they've heard arguments, and I think we're all waiting to hear about that. So, uh, so uh, her was from China. You know, there are countries, you, you can think about some of the countries where you might predict some of this work is being carried out currently. So I'm, I'm not very optimistic about that. I'm, I'm a bit pessimistic about that. So. I hope I didn't give a, a sense of naivete about whether this is proceeding, yeah. The CRISPR-Cas9 stuff, uh, well, there was a Netflix show, what was it called? Ah, having a senior moment, can't re re retrieve it. It was a Netflix show about people in their garages administering CRISPR to themselves. So that technology is really easy to perform and that's a, that's a huge concern. Yeah, John. Um, So the question is about in vitro fertilization. That's a great question. So there's one thing that I didn't talk about IVF tonight. Um, in many IVF clinics, a woman is super ovulated, so you get a boatload of oocytes. They're all fertilized, and there's too many to implant. So a lot of those embryos are frozen. That works really well. So you have a frozen embryo in liquid nitrogen. They can be banked for decades. I think the record is like 27 years now. That might even be higher now. Gloria might know that. Um, so that's just a concern right there. But there are IVF clinics. There's one in southern Wisconsin I know that will, and, and many IVF clinics are moving towards this, of only fertilizing as many oocytes as can be safely implanted. So that gets around the, the frozen embryo crisis problem. But the other thing is that um, I think, uh, Protestants don't agree about this, it's true. So many um, conservative reformed or evangelical Protestants would say that the success rates of IVF are comparable to what we, it's hard to measure, but what we think we know about natural success rates of implantation. 
So in that case, then IVF seems like it would, it's, it's a legitimate therapy because its level of success is comparable to the standard biological process. And so they would say, because of that, they would be cautious, but they would allow for limited use of IVF. But, you know, uh, destruction of excess embryos, I think, creates ethical dilemmas of the sort that we've been talking about tonight. Um, there's a certain simplicity about the Roman Catholic approach to the problem, and, but it's rooted in a whole lot of other theological um, foundations that I didn't have time to talk about tonight. Yeah. Uh, that I talked about tonight? Yeah, I think so, yeah, uh, um, right. Last question. Last question. I was not. <laughs> but, but you did it again later on because you said the embryo has a way of figuring it out. I do, yeah. Well, that's, that's shorthand for cellular signals are exchanged between the remaining constituent cells, which leads to altered pathways of gene expression and subsequent um, specialization or what's called differentiation of the cells. I don't. I did not mean to imply that there was an intelligence latent in the embryo that is, is directing that process. Uh, but some people might think that, that there is such uh, present in embryos. We, you know, there are different views on whether, do, can we understand ourselves just purely biologically or do we need a non-material uh, extra thing that is part of our essence. So there are Roman Catholic thinkers who think along those lines of various sorts. Uh, many of them are influenced by St. Thomas Aquinas, for example, and he goes back to Aristotle. And so they would say the, it's a life force, basically, that's not inherent in the biology. Most biologists don't know what that would mean in terms of understanding the biological mechanisms. It doesn't mean that, that there might not be good reasons for believing that there's a non-material essence alongside the biological constituents of a human organism. Um, but natural science doesn't have any obvious way of, of penetrating behind whatever non-material entity there might be. So um, uh, we might use the word soul for that kind of non-material entity. I was careful not to talk about that. I think there are good reasons for believing that that might be the case, but it's just kind of hard to, hard to understand that from a biological perspective. So I tried to stick to the, the biology tonight. Does that help? That was a great, so see, this is an example of, you guys are really smart, right? <laughs> so I don't like it. And I don't know you, but you know, when you say, my wife often has the most penetrating questions uh, for the work that I do, and, and that's, that's an outstanding question that um, you, you got right to the heart of a key issue that I didn't even want to touch tonight. So, <laughs> you know, yeah, I can come back and we can touch it if you want. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thanks so much, Jeff. Thanks, uh, thanks everybody. Yeah.